Kirk Webster uh, from Vermont. Uh, when we had Jennifer Berry here last year, I uh, said, could you give me some uh, good, uh, good uh, folks to reach out to? And she said, we got to call up Professor Berry. So I'm really pleased to present to you this morning uh, the Assistant Professor of Etymology at uh, the University of Delaware, uh, Professor Debbie Lee. Because I think this is really important. So, fetal 
honeybees have 16 pairs of chromosomes. One of those pairs contains, or, or are the sex chromosomes, with the sex loci. And what does this mean? Well, we'll look at it in more depth. If we look at the queen here, we see that she has 32 chromosomes, 16 pairs. And we call this diploid. And this makes a lot of sense that the male is haploid and only has one sex. So he has 16 chromosomes. And the worker, of course, just like the queen, has 32 or um, 16 pairs. All right, so if we look at those, in each of these examples, you see two of them on the females are sex chromosomes. And only one is a sex chromosome in the male. And so what does this mean? This is a unique kind of sexual system for all hymenoptera. That's ants, bees, and wasps. And why this is so cool in honeybees is that it makes for a really unique kind of social environment inside the colony. So let's kind of go through and look at this some more. So if we were to look at mating genetics, here we have this virginal queen, okay? She's flying because the girls are like, get out, get mated, or we are due. So she's on her mating flight right now. If we were kind of just to focus on her sex chromosome, which is kind of weird, but we're going to do that, you can see she has a red one and a light blue one. Now this is the comet of drones chasing her in that drone congregation area, wanting to mate with her. And they each have their one sex chromosome. And you can see, I've denoted the diversity of this drone comet by the different colors of their sex chromosome. So let's say in her sperm storage organ, because all queen honeybees have this special sperm storage organ called spermatheca, she actually is going to mate with say 12 to 15 of those different drones. And she's going to store sperm from them in that spermatheca inside of her body, okay? All right, so colony genetics. Now, that queen's mated. She goes back into the colony, so there she is. And she's going to sire a bunch of different workers, right? And what's interesting is the workers, she's actually going to choose, because when she lays an egg and chooses to release a sperm, it automatically becomes a female. It's diploid. It has 32 chromosomes or 16 pairs. So these are the different worker that she could produce based on the males that she mated with. So you can see these are all the sperm from those different drones, right? And she's giving each one of these workers one of her sex chromosomes and then one of the sex chromosomes from the drones that she mated with. So this is really interesting because just by looking at the workers' genetics, we can actually tell how many drones she mated with. And so we can get the colonial colony diversity by studying the workers' genetics. So for an example here, and we were to actually see how many subfamilies, or we call them patrimonies, because they're different fathers, right, are in that colony. We can actually look at that. And we can see we have, okay, here, um, I can't see where the one is. But I can just do it from looking at it. So we have one here, and then we have one here. See, she did, donated the blue, so there's a purple drone. So that's two. And we have, uh, she donated the red, and that's like a black, so it's coming from there. So that's three. And then we have four, and that would be the same because of the yellow. So this is the same yellow drone. Um, so we have about six different subfamilies or patch lines in this colony. And we can just tell that by taking a sampling of the workers and looking at their genetics. I think that's really fascinating. And, um, and something very easy to do. Because a big concern amongst beekeepers is, are the queens that we are getting, are they well mated? There's a lot of problems with queen failure. So this was a big part of my work actually in North Carolina. I did a postdoc with Dave Carthy. And what we did is we got queens from all the different commercial queen breeders that up and knowing it. And we actually looked at how well mated they were. Just looking at this, just at this exact thing. As well, to confirm it, I was given the task also of dissecting out the spermatheca and counting the number of sperm in there. Which is not fun. Dave is important. No, I'm just, Dave is wonderful. But, um, so we could actually see how well mated these different queens were. I'm not going to present that work today um, because that would be way too long. <laughs> but what I want you to take home just from this part is the sex determination in honeybee colonies and what it can actually tell us. So if an egg is heterozygous at the sex loci, and I'll, this next slide you'll be able to visually see this, meaning <coughs> it's different at the sex loci. Okay, it's not the same. It's a red one and a blue one, not a red one and a red one. 
then it will become a female. And we know that later on, that, you know, Mary's critical age, that three-day age old larvae, actually, if it's fed a certain diet, it'll go on to become either a worker or a queen. But this is before that. This is before that, if the queen actually chooses to release a sperm to fertilize the egg. If she does, it will become a female. If an egg is homozygous at the sex side, the individual will be a diploid drone. We don't like those, right? So if for some reason she chooses to fertilize the egg and she has given it a red sex chromosome and the sperm that she uses is red, then it will become a diploid drone. And we'll talk about that in a minute. If the egg is unfertilized, therefore haploid, the individual will become a viable haploid drone. And let's look at this visually. All right, so we have the queen here, and we have this handsome-looking young drone right here. And she mates with that drone, okay? If she were just to mate with that drone, this is a different potential offspring that she could produce. If she doesn't choose to release any sperm, so she doesn't fertilize eggs, she just lays eggs, she could either make this drone with a blue sex chromosome or this drone with a red sex chromosome. If she was to fertilize the egg, if she gave it a red one, and, and, and a blue one, then it would be a diploid worker because it's different at the sex locus, okay? If, she, however, by accident she gave that one and it came from that one, it would be a diploid drone. And what happens with a diploid drone is that they're not viable. And it's kind of evolved in the system of honeybees that the workers actually know this and will chew out the diploid drones. And this is what we call a shotgun brood pattern. And this is a sign of inbreeding. And this is a sign that we need to increase genetic diversity somehow into our apiary. All right, so of course, this is, a good, this is an outsourced drone. He's not from around here. And so they have nice viable offspring. All right, so this is just an example, kind of saying, better management techniques. So drone layer is not mated, right? She's not mated. So what's she going to, what's the only thing she can make? Drones, because she can't fertilize those eggs. Shotgun brood pattern is a sign of inbreeding because we have diploid drones, okay? So why some queens get superseded is because the queen runs out of sperm. They go drony, right? So kind of by looking at these, when we see these different things in our hives, you can understand the biology behind it, which I just love. Okay, adequate levels of genetic variation, and I feel like this is like the poster child for all of life anymore. I mean, people study um, uh, elephant seals and black rhinoceros and the cheetahs, and we're realizing that gen genetic diversity is essential for an organism to overcome problems, um, diseases, pests, pathogens, and we are seeing this also true with honey. All right, so selecting for desirable traits, um, breeding and trait selection. So differences in behaviors and traits is genetic variability. And it's the raw material for selection. So we need to have that in our genetic pool, right? Identification of colonies with desirable traits. Selection of queen and drone mothers for the next generation. And this is becoming really, really important at the beekeeping and beekeeping association level because many, many people are interested in raising their own queens, in looking to stock that might be coming from the surrounding areas that maybe has <coughs> some type of local adaptation. So a lot of this big kind of backyard beekeeping and local raising queen movement is really starting to take off, at least on the East Coast here that I've seen. All right, so what is responsible for colony behavior and traits? Well, as you would imagine, the genotype of the queen and the workers and environmental factors. So just like our human kids, where it's genetics, but it's, all, it's nurture and nature, it's the same with the honeybees. And this is a really, you can see this with Africanized honeybees. They'll take an Africanized honeybee that's in a really warm area, and they'll be really hot. They'll just be extremely aggressive or defensive, let's say. Where if you were to take those and put those same bees up in the mountains at a higher altitude, they might act and have very, very different behavior. And so that's an example of environmental kind of variables affecting their behavior. All right, this is actually the apiary that I, we were doing a breeding project, and that's the queen bearing project that I was in charge of at Washington State. Um, and so this is a very isolated mating yard. 
uh, that we had that had no food. It was awful. Constant, constantly having to feed and the problem with adding on. Um, it was really, really stressful for the bees. But that's what we had to work with. And this is an apiary in the Sonoran Desert. So you can see people actually keep bees and very productive with bees all over the world and in all different types of climates. All right, so selecting for desirable traits. Temperament. You know, for centuries, people have been selecting for temperament. Um, you know, my bees are as gentle as the teddy bears. I can pet them, you know. And personally, I like to have a little sass in my girls because they seem to make, be better producers for me, at least my sassy ones do. Um, but then there's also pollen collecting. They've actually done this scientifically, actually increased and kept selecting for this pollen collecting strain. So much so that the strain, the stock that they produced, was so sickly. Because when you're selecting for one particular trait, you're also selecting for other traits that you're not aware of sometimes. So that's why it's really tricky business, this kind of genetic and the selecting breeding programs. It's hard work. <coughs> also, honey production. This is something that we all do. Our colonies that produce really good honey, it would be really great to make uh, more queens from that one, right? Those are the ones that you're going to target in your yard if you're going to raise queens. All right, so selecting for desirable traits. Another one would be swarming. You don't want to select for that, obviously, but there's a lot of people who, who feel like if you use a queen cell then, and start that and use that as a queen source, then you're going to be selecting for swarming, which is kind of a controversial issue in Delaware right now with our people. Um, some other ones are overwintering ability. Um, and then, of course, disease resistance, behavioral and physiological. And there's all sorts of different stocks that are suspended kind of having different variable behaviors and traits to different pests. Mm -hmm. Buck fat being a really, really obvious example for tracheomites. All right. Using improved stocks of bees is an effective way to improve the productivity of the <coughs> population. And I absolutely 100% agree. The stock in your apiary is key to the success of your apiary. It has to be a stock that you can work with and that you understand. And as Seth so eloquently was saying, I'm not sure where you're already on it, um, that you can talk with it. You can be talked with it. That you guys can communicate. And different stocks I have trouble communicating with, I'm realizing. Um, right now I have a really wonderful <coughs> stock in my yard. But I can't I can't stress enough the importance of good stock. That you're picky. You be picky. All right. So now here's the part where I'm going to try to show to you guys that I think DNA is a really cool tool for understanding honeybees. And so DNA contains information in the sequence of bases. And what these bases are, it's A, G, T, and C. So just letters, okay? And the sequence of DNA varies between individual organisms. So this one might have a C-A-T, or this one has a C-A-G. And so then we can differentiate them based on that. Okay, and we'll go through this more and more, but this is a way that we can make family trees or phylogenies to see how closely related different organisms are. It's a tool for understanding diversity in a species. So, this would be an example of a gel that I would get out of my work, looking at the DNA from honeybees from all over this country. So this is looking at mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondrial DNA is specifically inherited or given maternally. So you get your you have your mom's mitochondrial DNA, and she has her mom's and so forth, and you have your mom's and, and I have my mom's, and so that's how it's inherited. So you can track the maternal ancestry of any type of organism by looking at the mitochondrial DNA, and that's really <coughs> an interesting fun tool to use on honeybees. So you can see here with this gel, we've got quite a diversity of mitotypes. So each one of these, so this one here obviously is the same. This one's a little bit different. Each one is suggesting a different maternal origin for that particular bee. Each different pattern. We also can use nuclear DNA. So nuclear DNA is different because it's inherited from both the mother and the father. So the limitation with mitochondrial is that you're not <coughs> taking into account drones. You're not taking into account paternity. Whereas with nuclear DNA, you're taking into account the contributions from both the mother and the father. So this is how we would look at diversity using nuclear DNA. So this is worker one from this colony, one. And if we were to look at a particular area on that chromosome and look at that code, that CAGT, we would see that it has this particular peak and this particular peak. These are different alleles, OK? 
okay, we put the thumb thing up, but it's just a different size. If we look at the same exact area on the chromosome, at this stage, from, from colony two, they would have 135 and 145 at that same particular spot. So we know they have a different ancestor. They're, they're, they're not as closely related. Because if they were closely related, if they were from the same colony, they would have the 137 and 149. So that's kind of how we can use this genetic tool, this nuclear DNA. Does, everyone have to make, does that make sense? Because otherwise, everything else I'm going to say is not going to have any credibility. <laughs> yeah. What if they have a different grown father? If they have a different grown father, um, then there is some slight variation. And, and that's what I was saying, how you can take a handful of workers from a colony, and you can actually, just from those workers, determine all the patrons. So you can get a colonial diversity first. And doing that, just by grabbing workers, you can actually get relatedness of colonies, relatedness of queens. That's something else we did with, in the David Carpe when I worked for him. We looked at relatedness of the queens. And so we would get 10 from one queen <coughs> here. And then we looked at the relatedness of those queen mothers, to see if they were like sisters or whatnot. All right, so now I'm gonna move into this area that I'm really excited about. Um, and this is one of the pictures from one of the bee trees that I collected from in North Carolina. And as we know, and if you've heard Tom Seeley speak before, then you know a lot about this probably, that honeybees naturally, in a natural population, in their natural environment, are cavity nesters. And where do they find some perfect cavities? But in caves, rock ledges, and in our type of environment, trees. And the location is dependent on the amount of cavities present but also in their ability to thermoregulate those cavities. So work done by previous wonderful researchers have shown that they prefer a certain um, <coughs> amount of space, excuse me, in the nest in which to live and thermoregulate. So here's this picture from Tom Seeley and Roger Morse's work on um, honeybees in the Arnott Forest. And you can see here, this is the basic schematic. Um, up top here, we have the honey storage. And you know, we've really designed wonderful inventors. Beekeepers are excellent tinkerers and inventors. They just are. And they've looked at this natural nest and seen how honeybees do it naturally. And we now do that with our hives. There's a separation of food and brood. We have this pollen storage band right there. And then, of course, the whole inside, and Dr. Marla Spivak, hopefully she'll come here and talk to you guys soon, uh, her work with propolis, showing the immune the, the important immune factors that propolis gives to the honeybee. The whole head nest is encapsulated in a propolis envelope. Okay? And so I just, I love this picture. It makes me really happy. And you can see there's queen cells down here at the bottom. We have the drone comb right here. And so this is a natural nest. Very generalized picture. So five features that kind of um, have been targeted as good features for a natural nest location has to be sheltered and darkened, small defensible entrance, size with adequate volume, parallel beeswax comb constructed with bee space, of course, and separation of brood and food in the comb. Here's another one. This was actually in downtown Raleigh in a walnut tree, right outside of the Department of Ag. I thought that was appropriate. <laughs> that was one of the first bee trees I collected from. All right, so this is this these specific kind of uh, numbers come from work that was done by Tom Seeley and Arnott. And he found that the volume they preferred was from 20 to 100 liters. Height from ground, uh, they prefer higher, nine feet and higher, uh, for sure. And he thought that it's probably much, much higher, uh, but you, you overlook them. You know, you're walking in a forest of trees, um, 100 feet up in the air in the split of some tree, you're not necessarily going to have some sonar to be like there's a bee tree up there. You know, a lot of times their flight path would be way above your head. You won't even know. Exposure. Sites in the uh, open exposed to wind or full sun are less attractive. We know that for, from experience in our own apiaries. Entrance size and position. They prefer smaller entrance holes. And cavity quality. Of course, dry and non-occupied would be helpful. Mm -hmm. Right, and I always like to think about this because I think honey hunting is still really prevalent in a lot of parts of the world. And really, our relationship, especially the early relationship with honeybees, was much like a hunter's relationship with other wildlife. We hunted at them for their products. 
And also, we hunted them for religious and spiritual reasons in some cultures. And I think honeybees, um, they're, they're, they were wild. They didn't depend on us for management. And in a lot of regions, they still don't. And I want to say to you as well, some of the feral bees in this country don't depend on us either. And I find that fascinating. All right, so this occupation of beekeeping pretty much evolved from this honey hunting, this kind of hunting relationship. And with this occupation of beekeeping, different things occurred. <coughs> and I want to also say that this occupation of beekeeping evolved from honey hunting, and one of the main reasons <coughs> is we figured out how to provide them a nest cavity. We were the ones who decided and figured out how to provide them a nest cavity and move them. So we no longer had to stake claim and stake ownership to that bee tree. Now we could just cut that section of the bee, tree right off the bee, the nest right off the tree and move it. And we were able to expand their range to all over the world in any different type of climate. This is the success of the honeybee. Their ability to thermoregulate their nest allows us to move them wherever we want to put them. Um, we were also able to manage them for honey. We are able to select for desirable traits. So once we move them to where we want, then we can kind of select for them for desirable traits in that particular area. So now we have local selection going on. Because we have them where we want them, now we can decide what's important to us in our operation, our, our apiary. We can use them for pollination. All right, so the populations of honeybees in the United States, and this is really simplified here. But for my purposes, I'm going to break it down into managed populations. So these are populations that are managed by breeders and by other beekeepers. And then we have feral populations. So these are represented by any colonies or nests not maintained by beekeepers. So the stock is not controlled by the large bee breeding entities in this country that we know of. So some of my work with my PhD actually looked at the queen breeders and I sampled it. I actually thought I wanted to be a commercial queen breeder until I went and interned and, and worked for one. And, um, and no, they're, it's an amazing business. They're <laughs> such hard work, but I would never want to do anything at that exploitative level. It's just not my, it ruins the harmony I have with my bees. It's too big for me. Um, but when I actually sampled them and looked at their mitochondrial DNA, so now I'm looking at workers so collected from queen mothers, so these were all the queen mothers that were used to produce daughter queens for sale in the years 1994 and then recollected from the same queen breeders in California in 2004. When I looked at all of the stock they used, this is the mitochondrial diversity. So you can see, and I'll tell you what this kind of relates to, C1, C2, and C3, which are represented on both of these charts, refers to Carnica and Magustica. And what those two subspecies are, are the Italians and the Carniolas. And this makes sense, because when you buy breeder queens, uh, generally they're advertising an Italian or a Carniola, right? Or a Golden, or some which is Italian. And so they are selling what they're selling. It's true. It's true. They have really limited their stock to these two different types of subspecies. Um, we see also this M3. This M3 refers to Apis mellifera mellifera, which is not a subspecies that currently is vended, or so we think, here in the US. Now I'll give you a little bit more information for this next slide. So this is the southern commercial breed, uh, queen breeders uh, from 1993 and then again from 2005. You can see where they were sampled. And um, you can see their stock is a little bit more diverse. Okay? And this makes a lot of sense when you think about the importation history of honeybees into North America. They were first found on the east, or found to be imported by ship logs, we'll talk about that in a minute, on the east coast. And so we have a lot more of the M, the mellifera, mellifera. Okay, so we have M7, M7 prime, and M4 prime. Down here we have M7, M7 prime, M3, and an A. Okay, so what's interesting about this A is that this is an Africanized breeder queen. And so, and, and everyone's like, oh, great. But the thing is, I, I hand sampled all of these, and none of the colonies that that particular person, uh, at, at that 
particular person's breeder yard were mean. His ponies were really, really nice. So it, it may come up as mitochondrial, like the ancestry has African ancestry, but I did not have any problem with that colony. I remember the colony. So uh, I want to uh, kind of stop people's fears from going out of control there. Yes? How did it get here? What, what do you mean? Oh yeah, so African Africanized bees have been moving up into the U.S. Oh, the, the mothers too, absolutely. Yep, yep. It's been a, a northward movement, um, and there, there, and a lot of studies. What I'm saying too is we don't even know the extent. Of, we'll get into this later, but we don't even know the extent of Africanization because we, the markers that we use, are all maternal, so we have no clue the paternal contributions in terms of Africanized, you know, ac true Africanization in this country. But we'll talk about that later. But one thing I want to take from this is that there's definitely, look, it's still mostly the Carniolan and the Italians, but there is a little bit more diversity in the Southern commercial queen breeding stock in the mid-2000s. All right, so this is nuclear DNA. So now we're getting contributions from the mother and the father. And let me explain what this particular um, slide is saying. They have cluster one and cluster two, and one of them, the red one, represents the western commercial breeding population, and the green, the southern commercial breeding population. And what I want you to get from this is that they're genetically different from each other. So that geographic separation from the west coast to the east coast actually has created genetic diversity. They're genetically distinct, which um, a lot of people think they should swap stock. It will increase diversity right here in the U.S. So this was true in the 1990s, and it also is true in the mid-2000s, that these are genetically distinct commercial pools, genetic pools. All right, so now what's going on with the feral honeybees? Because at the same time, you have this commercial industry, commercial queen breeders making all these commercial queens for sale. They have a snapshot into what that stock is composed of. Now let's look at the feral population. So the feral population is that population that's in, in the forest, in the churches that have been there for 50 years up in the eaves, right? So what, what's, what's their story? All right, so in 1980 to 1991, Steve Shepard, my PhD advisor, actually went and collected feral bee nests from all over the southern United States. And they were in his minus 80 freezer in his lab, and I was like, can I look at those? And so I decided to look at those, and what I found is that as we kind of still continue on, this is 600 different colonies, we can see the diversity here. And what we find is there is much more diversity of Apis mollifera and mollifera. Okay? And so this is the Carniolans, the Lagusticas, the Italians, Carniolans, and things like that. Apis mollifera and mollifera is much more prevalent in this feral population. So this is the pooled feral population. We also have Apis mollifera lamarckii, which is a particular <coughs> subspecies from the Nile Delta Valley in Egypt. And this actually, we're still finding pockets of this even still today when we look at mitochondrial DNA. So this is based on maternal ancestry, this graph. Can you tell how long they did Well, from records, we know that Apis mollifera lamarckii was brought in in 1865. So, that's the first record. To be able to see that continuous, that the clades show up as being here for that long Yes, yes. That's the only way that they could have been here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you, can you talk a little bit about, I mean, why do we have the liberal and liberal? Can we stop producing the liberal and liberal in the mid-1800s when, you know, yes. the are these actually from feral colonies that survived in the wild and have Yes. Yes. This, this Apis mollifera that you're seeing is actually here. And so let me just explain this next slide, because and then, and then we'll go on. This next slide is looking at this feral population compared to the commercial populations um, and looking at nuclear DNA. And what you're seeing is that they're completely genetically distinct. They're two separate populations. 
there's very little gene flow going between the feral and the commercial populations. And there's a lot of different things that could keep this isolation. If you think about it, what could be one of the main things that could keep two, two different populations to, distinct from one another? Some barrier. So what would be a really good barrier? Mountains, so geographic. But also, what about just mating behavior? What about this group, the Apis mellifera, because they're from this different climate, generally produces drones during this time of year. And the queens, and they swarm during this time of year, but this particular stock's been selected for this way, and they produce drones a month earlier or a month later. So you can have just reproductive isolation that, that just due to the biology that separates these pools which I think is also fascinating. All right, so the conclusions are feral and managed populations are genetically distinct. And to answer your question about Apis mellifera mellifera, I don't think I touch on it on this, on this presentation, and it's hard for me to check and see if I do. I don't think I do. Is the Apis mellifera mellifera was first brought in, in we, the first record we have is 1621. But there's anecdotal evidence that it actually happened 100 years earlier. And these are, populations, pockets that have survived from that time. Because they have not been that German dark bees. <coughs> if you go to the remote pockets, like I, I, I go all over the country looking for weird bees. And uh, people be like, oh, you gotta go to the swamp bees and the, you know, old Sanofi. And I'm just like, isn't there snakes and other things down there as well? I don't know. I really want some of those dark weird swamp bees, but um, will you guide me? Yeah, will you be my guide? <laughs> but yeah, so a lot of bees, you, the weird ones you hear about are dark, you know, they have really long hair and they're dark black, you know. And um, and so a lot of these, when we do look at them, are maternally, but kind of <coughs> Apis mellifera mellifera. All right. So there's lots of feral populations. The status of feral honeybee populations, you've heard this many times. And it's based off, I want to tell you, a couple of studies done on islands off of California um, that say that 90 to 95% reduction of this feral population. And I'm not suggesting that there wasn't a huge reduction in the feral population. But I don't think we can quantify it because we have no studies to, that really have quantified it across the country. So we don't really know what the true reduction of the feral population due to varroa Vero is. So what are in these bee trees? What are in these church eaves? What is this feral kind of non-bred population? So I started this feral bee project when I was working with David Tarpey. And I really wanted to be a citizen scientist kind of uh, development. And so I got involved with this excellent computer person who put this Google um, system together for me called SaveTheHives.com. And basically, you can go onto the site, and there's filters, and you can log on the coordinates of a bee tree or a nest that you know. There's different caveats. It has to have been there for a certain amount of time. I know sometimes it's hard to tell because swarms can come in and swarms can go, but I can look at, figure that out looking at the genetics. Um, but the main thing I don't want to do is drive really far away and find out that it's yellow jackets. <laughs> <laughs> That's a problem. And, and also, I'm, I'm actually allergic to yellow jackets, so that's another big problem. So you can see, this is uh, just a snapshot of, of um, the uh, North Carolina area where, where, where the project started. And we have sampled now, I think, over 700 different feral nests. Um, we're expanding, of course, since I've moved to Delaware in the past couple of years. Um, north now, and we're getting a lot more um, from all over. Um, Tim Schuller was really helpful, and with my student, and also telling us whereabouts of, and samples for some. Thank you very much. And so we're trying to get a regional idea of what are the genetics of this feral population, these kind of uh, swarms and, and bee trees, and what are, what are they? So we can kind of utilize maybe stock in our own backyards. That's the kind of idea here. And so this is the website, savethehives.com. Even if you don't feel comfortable putting anything on there, it's still fun to look at it, check it out, see where these different bee trees are occurring. You can just get a general idea of it, like, oh, people are going to go find them and kill them. And I don't really hope people aren't that evil. I mean, I really hope people really aren't that evil. And really, what you can I'm the only person who has access to the science. So, and then there's also a column there if you want people to, to sample it. And if it says no, of course, we respect that. And there's contact information, so I always contact everyone to make sure it's okay for me to come and collect. I just collect 20 workers um, per colony, uh, and I have slides kind of showing you how I do that. Um, all right, so this project started out as, um, it had three levels. So 
So a natural population level, a statewide collection level, and then a regional collection level. And we're working on all of them simultaneously right now. And I want to go through what we're doing with the natural population. I started out putting actual bait hives out in Duke Forest. Um, I put 90 bait traps out all around uh, Raleigh Durham area in the forest. It was quite an adventure. Um, we have, I think, right now 10 occupied that have been occupied out of the 90, which is disheartening. I was nine months pregnant when I hung these things. And so I can only get them this high because my husband wouldn't let me climb the ladder. So I think that's one of the main problems with the establishment. They need to be higher up in the air, but I try. Uh, but we are following the 10, um, and uh, we're getting a lot of interesting data off the 10. But the idea behind looking at a natural population is to see how a natural population, the dynamics of it. Like, what are their swarm uh, or mite levels? Do they go up and down naturally with no management? How often do they swarm? Um, does a, a, a bee tree, does a wax inside of a bee tree, does it contain tons of chemicals and pesticides? Uh, there's so many different things we could learn from just kind of observing at a distance somewhat a natural population. So Tom Staley absolutely agreed with me. And um, I teamed up with him because he is a guru. And he actually caught and trapped different bee trees via bee mining. He showed me how to do it, too. It was really fun. And we have samples from um, 10 different bee trees in the Arnott Forest. And right now, I'm ferociously, quickly, trying to look at their genetics. So I'm extracting DNA. And what we also have are samples from the two, only two apiaries surrounding Arnott Forest. So there's two apiaries on the very edges. And what we're going to do as a quick, quick study is to see if they're genetically different. Are the bees and the bee trees genetically different from the apiaries or around the edges? Um, and this is just one kind of thing that we're looking at. We're also looking at how well mated the bee tree queens are. So we're doing 50 bees from each. We can kind of see the, uh, colonial diversity there. Um, and so it's a really neat project. We're about halfway through um, going through the samples. Uh, slide before that showed uh, some trees. Do you see any preference for them to go to a certain type of tree? I, I asked Tom that because he's been tracking these since the 70s in our not forest and the numbers keep going up. Um, so uh, this is, a, and, and they have mites, and but they they somehow have mites and are able to coexist with the mites. And so that's what we were commonly excited about this population. And overall, he said he sees no preference when he does it, looks at it statistically just based on, but it's based on a small sample size. You know, the Arnott Forest is 16 square kilometers, or so, um, yeah, so it's, you know, it's, it's not, it's just based on that. So you're talking about um, kind of uh, bringing in diversity to the commercial stock from feral sources possibly. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit towards the end. These questions. All right, so the regional, like I said, now it's above 700. Um, but this is also one of the cavities that we, I just think they're so beautiful, the openings and the trees. You can see this orange here, this is all populous. Um, so as each one is kind of unique and different, and it's just really, really beautiful to see how they work, the cavity. Um, th there's that one again. There's me with my net. Um, and so generally what I do is I'll drive out and I'll find, um, when I was in North Carolina, they were always in old tobacco barns. Um, and for a while, I thought they were addicted to nicotine. <laughs> 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 driving and it's fields of tobacco plants and I almost wanted to smoke like it's been <laughs> they release some weird odor those plants and it's weird weird uh, vibe there but also poison ivy they would also like poison ivy um, there we go so basically I aggravate them in front of their <laughs> their entrance to their nest and then I get them in the net, and then I just hand fuck them into a container of alcohol. And that's how I get my samples. Um, and so it's not, it doesn't bother them for too long. Um, and it's not, I don't like open it up and take part of the, half, part of the tree off or anything. Um, you can see there's another tobacco barn. 
um, with an entrance on the side there. Uh, this is uh, an awesome, uh, what is it, junkyard. And I guess some bees must have gotten in here for a while because this is just one bee dozer. I call it the bee dozer. Um, there was a front loader that I collected from. There was an excavator I collected from. My boys were like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. Um, there, was it. there was one, actually, there's a big old back of the truck, and we went in it, and there's a big old, I might have a picture of it. There's a big old tire, and there was a nest inside the tire in the van trunk, or, you know, back. Um, so this, obviously, somebody had been sending out tons of swarms, because when we looked at them, we, we could see they were all kind of related to one another. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. Um, this was a really, really great story, and this particular nest was Apis mellifera mellifera, um, and was very genetically distinct when they looked at their nuclear DNA. And this is on the coast of North Carolina, about 100 feet up, it seems, just way, way high up, maybe not that high, um, in this big old tree. And I thought to myself, I had driven four hours, drove my family with me to go collect this, and I was like, there's no way I can get this. I just would take a picture of it. But then, these wonderful farmers said, ah, you can't get it for you. So this guy got up on there, and he's barefoot, he's barefoot on you. And he was like, I'll get you the sample, and he brought it down, and there had to be like 100 bees in the, in the net, and he's like, is that enough? And they're all swarming around, he's all like, <laughs> Thank you so much. And I'm really glad he did because it's a, a very interesting sample of bees. Um, and, yeah. The German honeybees, right? Are you confident that they really are very defensive? Because if you read the old literature there, they were pretty hot bees. Yeah, and I think it really depends on when I'm collecting. Like, what's going on? If it's a dirt, if it's slow, I mean, some of them, like, I, I, I can see now which ones are coming up, like, from Olympra and Olympra. And, and some of them, like, I collected them, and it was not a big deal at all. They weren't any more defensive than this, these other ones. So um, I think it's really variable. I think it's also very environmental, like, what's going on in the environment then. But I, it's not like I've worked them, you know, like, I've worked my eyes. It's like I'm just kind of collecting. All right, so there's that one again. All right, so while, how I'm looking at these, like I said, I gave you hopefully enough information to understand what I mean by mitochondrial DNA and what I mean by nuclear DNA. And what we've found so far, and this is just one slide because there's a bunch of, a bunch of, the tree wouldn't fit. Um, so this is just a subsample. But we're finding that we can make some interesting trees. These are just the ones in North Carolina um, in the central and kind of the, central horizontal sampling of North Carolina. And we find that there's a grouping of feral hives into three different kind of clades of groupings here. And if we were to map those out, if you follow those colors, let's go back, this orange, or this green, this pink, and this blue, I was hoping, in a wonderful world, that they would actually, the blue ones would be on the coast, and the pink ones would be in the middle, and, and that's, that's not really what we found. And, but as we're at, so you can see the spread here. So there's the blue, there's the green and the pink. And as we're, we actually added more, and we're starting to get more statistical strength to show that there is some population structure due to different physiographic climates. Because if you think about North Carolina, you have the coastal plains, you have the Piedmont, and then you have the mountains. And so you have huge altitudinal and temperature changes in these regions. So you would think there would be some type of local adaptations. So that is still a question we're trying to answer. This is just preliminary. Um, the starred areas here are Apis mellifera and mellifera nests. So this is just a few of the ones that we found. And what's really interesting is that we're finding most, one kind of statistical oddity is that all of the Apis mellifera and mellifera nests are way high up in these huge, huge trees. Okay? And you wouldn't even really know if that they were there. It's just they've been there for so long, people know about them historically, and they tell you about them, and they're really hard to sample. Usually I have to bring sugar syrup and bake them down to a feeding station. Um, so something about them being isolated in space I, I might have something to do with the way they can sustain themselves there. Maybe they're, they're not exposed to some of the other um, commercial bees. All right, so when we look at the nuclear DNA, 
So this is based on the nuclear DNA. And you can see here that this is the collection that I've done in the past, looking at commercial populations and also that feral population in the past. And when we compare them um, to this population here, the ones that I've collected so far, they're, they're genetically different. They're, there's something going on here. Um, if I was to remove those, the old feral population would separate out more from these commercial populations. But because I have these new ones in, they're so genetically different that it's making the old feral population look like they're more similar to the commercial populations. It's really weird. We're still trying, we're constantly adding samples to this. So this is based on morphometrics. So courtesy of Dr. David de Jong in Brazil. And so he, uh, morphometrics is a way that, another technique we use for identifying Africanized bees. So it's looking at body parts and measuring wing angles and measuring hair length and tongue length and all these different morphological characters in order to get an ID on subspecies. And when we look at morphometrics of the natural environment, which is this blue circle here, versus managed colonies from similar areas in North Carolina, they all kind of lump together. Okay, and, but what's interesting about North Carolina, and I don't know, it, it might be true here in New Jersey, a lot of the North Carolina people, um, they actually are hobbyists, small-scale beekeepers, and they like to collect swarms. And so a lot of them don't actually buy breeder stock. And so this is really interesting. What you're seeing over here, this is actually Lagustica, but just from Italy. You know, so this is real Lagustica. And um, what else do we have here? Carnica, so real Carnica. And then up here we have the Caucasica and the Molecra Molecra. So what we have here in North Carolina is completely separating out from the typical subspecies, from any of the typical subspecies. So it's all kind of like, what is really going on? We're not quite sure. But what the information that we're going to get out of this eventually, once we get through all these samples, is genetic structure and behavior of honeybee populations in different climates. This is something that's really important to a lot of us backyard beekeepers. We want stock that's going to be, that know how to use the forage, know how to use the environment around where we live. Um, and we don't want to necessarily buy queens from Florida or Georgia and bring them up to deal in this temperate, crazy, weird weather up here, right? Um, we want to understand dispersal rates of bees across the landscape. So like you were talking about, Africanized bees moving and how, how stocks and things move across the landscape. That's other information we can get. Um, also effects of Varroa. What are the true effects of Varroa on genetic diversity of feral bee populations? And monitor for Africanized bees. This is one of my graduate students is working on that project right now. Um, she would have been here today, but um, she has a qualifying exam on Monday at school. Um, but she is actually taking all these samples that I'm collecting and she's trying to develop a nuclear marker to be able to look and determine the level of Africanization. Because the tools we have now can only detect high levels of Africanization because it's using morphometrics in mitochondrial DNA. Um, also, this is why I'm really into it as well, isolate good breeding stock, survivor stock. So we have all these major declines in managed bee populations, but these bees in are not forest and these other bees that are surviving if we find that they are actually relics, why are they surviving? What are the mechanisms that are allowing them to coexist with all these pests and pathogens and mites? And I want to know. I want those bees in my yard. All right, so like I said, we're kind of interested in the introduction of Africanized genes into managed honeybees along the East Coast. And so because we have this extensive collection of feral honeybees or non-managed honeybees along the East Coast, we can look at their genetics and compare them to Africanized bees, which I have African bee samples as well as Africanized bees. So I can compare all of their genetics to see how Africanized our bees are. Because I was getting a lot of weird calls like this. Oh, I got bees in my water meter. I'm like, what? In the water meter? And then I get there and I'd be like, oh, they've absconded. They're gone. You know, and I get there and be just like a couple of combs left and there'd be no bees there anymore. And it was like, oh, kind of weird the one time, but five times it was like, this is really weird. And then I saw a weird usurpation swarm actually land on the front of uh, my friend's colony while we were harvesting honey and completely ball the queen and take it over. Um, so there's, and, and we're getting more reports of that. So 
these interesting behaviors, which I'm not saying can all be attributed to Africanization, but it just made me think we need better markers for assessing Africanization. All right, so that is the end of this particular story. And I have 10 more minutes. So it looks like I can answer questions. Anyone, you back there? When you, when you sample in regions, if there's, for example, in a region, a, a successful Russian queen breeding operation or a Minnesota hygienic, do you see, do you see those genes beginning to disperse among the, the colonies in that area? You know, I, you can, you can. And actually, um, Lady Bourgeoisie down at USDA, um, she does a lot of work with the Russian queen breeders, um, the ones that now have the stock that Prominger and them developed. And they are trying to develop markers, diagnostic markers, nuclear markers, to say this is still Russian. Because as you can imagine, even if you're flooding with drones and things like that, um, you're still going to have a dilution of that stock because they're ultimators, right? You can't control them too much. So I haven't necessarily focused and looked at that, but that would be something really interesting to look at. And it's a real problem for people who work on a line and want to keep traits they worked hard to get into a line, keep them there. It is this problem of dilution and dispersal of, of the genetics. So has any work been done on how that, on, on what that process is, how long it takes, or how long it might take to create a, that sort, those traits within a geography that can be maintained? I know there has been some work done looking at that. I don't know the exact numbers, but I could refer you to some papers that I think probably touch on it. And they're actually, funny enough, kind of older papers. Like work done by Rudner and, and people when they were studying races. Uh, you uh, scan uh, on a little bit more on uh, Steve Shepard's article where he referenced some research that maybe he did, or maybe he did, or one of the articles, that the pain readers, the pain readers, where they determined there was a small number of. Uh, That's the study that I showed yeah. you the pie charts for. Um, Sure, so when we actually sampled the commercial queen breeders, and, and this is actually, the, that PhD work was the impetus for Sue Kobe and Steve Shepard to get the, <coughs> the legal authority by APHIS to go to Germany and Italy and bring in new stock. Uh, because a lot of people feel, did not want that to happen. Um, there's definitely two sides. There's people who think we need genetic diversity and please bring it in and go get some new kind of diversity from the origin of these subspecies. And then there's people like, that's genetic pollution. I like things just the way they are. And over in Europe, it's really different. Because in Europe, because they're native to Europe, it's conservation of subspecies. They have local ecotypes that have evolved with a particular forage, like areas in France with heather. Um, so they think moving at all is genetic pollution. So it's a real different kind of idea. But when we looked at these commercial breeder queens, back on the point, sorry, I never heard it. Um, we see, we found that for, I, I forget the numbers exactly, I, I have a paper that's in the ESA, which her journal that I can send out. But um, it was in the five, 400 to 500 breeder queens were used to produce uh, close to a million um, daughter replacement queen. So um, that's essentially a huge bottleneck occurring. Um, and this was when we combined the numbers, it was just a giant, giant bottleneck. And that's taking account for all of the vended, kind of created commercial stock, right? But it's not also taking account for some of this feral contribution. If there, because there is probably some feral contribution that we don't know about in terms of diversity. In terms of our commercial breeding industry, um, it actually, um, there's a big bottleneck going on. And it's because some commercial queen breeders use two breeder queens to produce 6,000 daughters, and some use 50 and produce a, a much more sustainable. So it's a real spectrum of the way commercial queen breeders actually make queens. And you know, we're limited just by how often we can get to some of these places um, and sample them. So 
some. Because the mites may be killing them, and they just may be preoccupied. Absolutely, absolutely. That's absolutely true. I had a second observation. You mentioned shotgun brood pattern. Um, as, as a guy that does the disease inspection, we refer to shotgun brood as a possible symptom of uh, fowl brood. Yes. Um, you, were, you were talking about shotgun brood as a drone brood, not as a worker. No, it, it, it can occur in both. Oh, really? Yes, but you know, with AFB, there's other symptomology that, that diagnoses it. But um, yeah, no, it can actually be in in the worker group as well. Oh, hi. And you have a question. <laughs> At this point, we're not looking at that. Um, and we're not really doing any work with epigenetics. Um, uh, but I know that other people are. Other labs are, are really interested in methylation and other kind of epigenetic effects. Um, so I don't, I don't use that in my work. all the variables. That's just one piece of the information. If, I mean, and who knows? Well, it could be another reason. Now you have the specific kind of hygiene that's built into certain bees, this varroa sensitive hygiene, where they actually chew out caps. You know, the cells are already capped and they have some idea that there's something going on in there and they'll remove them. So there's other reasons now. But I think you have to look at what else is going on in your colony too. So does she have a good pattern? Is she, you know, laying, like, what's her laying pattern like? What is the temperament of the bees? Right? Are the workers productive? So you have to take the whole picture into account. And don't just say, oh, there's a couple holes out on a shotgun brood pattern. Um, with inbreeding depression, you have other characteristics that are going to happen in behavior in that hive. They're going to drop off in productivity. Um, they might be more susceptible to chalk brood, to, you know, to other, other diseases that can lie dormant um, in some instances in the, in the colony, but more susceptible bees to, you know, have it. Yes? Related to that same subject, I'm curious if you, if I identify a type of root matter in a hive, uh, would you suggest that this is a plant that I think is one of my whole lives, mm -hmm. but what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? Requeen it. Requeen and, you know, um, And what, really? Yeah. Well, that's interesting. And I'm, it, it's also nice to know who you, your beekeeper neighbors are. Um, and I try, like, how many colonies do you have? Okay. And so if you don't have a lot of, you know, bee population around you, and yours are the main ones feeding into a drug congregation area, then you could have that problem, you know? It's nice to know what other beekeepers are around you. Maybe no. Uh, I'm all for. I personally let my some of, a subset of my bees swarm, and I usually either, and then I let a subset of those actually swarm out, and then I actually collect a subset of them. So I'm, I'm, I do all these weird things when I'm here. But yeah, just increasing the diversity. So I also, when I buy bees, I tend to buy bees from all over the place as well um, until I find some that I like, and then. I usually kind of work with them for a while and select on them. He said, go to a bar. Um, and, but, you know, when they have examples, really neat things have come of it. A, a colleague of mine did some work in France, Jamie Strange, 
and he was looking at these local ecotypes, and he found that they're isolated by drone congregation by the time when they emit the drone. So it wasn't, yes, temporarily. It wasn't um, actually a physiological, yeah, in, in, in the drone congregation area. But you can imagine there's probably different behaviors that are selected for so that can separate us that way. So I wouldn't say that that's not possible. I haven't seen it. No. No. And we do have code that we've measured in. Um, and it's pretty variable, um, actually, what we found. And we haven't been able to correlate a particular size. We were talking about cell size. And if we found any correlation, that we have it in, in my work that we've done. Um, we, we have subsamples. Any of the nets that we can actually physically go in and grab some home if they're like low enough, we do. Um, and also, we're really interested in testing it uh, for our chemicals. So um, that was that last question. Yes. Can you tell the difference in the feral colonies if they were escaping from like the colonies? Yes. And what type of percent? We can. We can. We um, well, we have. Using, we use micro satellites and we use a number of them. And we can actually tell how closely related the different colonies are um, based on related to coefficients. And so we use 18 micro satellites, so 18 of these nuclear markers. And um, it's, we run it through all these simulations on this program, but it's, it, it'll tell you the introgression of, you give it a known population and allele frequencies at those 19 or 18 sites. And then it'll tell you who they kind of uh, uh, are most genetically similar to. I can show you um, in, in one of my papers. I explain it a lot, a lot better. Oh, absolutely. And that's one of the one of the problems. But the more samples we get, we have the genetic profile, like what is common allele that we find in the commercial stock. We know we have a genetic profile for commercial stock, um, and the genetic profile for some of what we're finding are truly feral is, is genetically very different. Um, so we really can tell the difference between these two. So I think I have time for one more question and that's it. Okay. <laughs> so far we're finding... What was the question? Yeah, we can uh, hear pest, the question. Uh, pesticides. What are we finding in feral cones? And so far, we've only looked at three, and um, it's really expensive. 